I'd like you to turn in your Bibles this morning to the Gospel of Luke chapter number 4. Luke chapter number 4, and I want us to examine this idea this morning of what defines you. For most people, a new year naturally brings about a time of reflection. The past year is often examined and analyzed in light of anticipated changes, or perhaps desires for the upcoming year. And these anticipated changes and desires are often described as New Year's resolutions. Uh, We are not going to spend a whole lot of time on New Year's resolutions. They certainly come in a variety of forms, but generally speaking, they're not upheld for very long. I have considered entering into a business of selling treadmills. I would only do it for two months, however, December into January. Uh, The remainder of the year, I don't think I would even need to, but uh, many, many, many pieces of exercise equipment have been purchased uh, in the month of December or in January, and by February, they're nothing more than another obstacle on which we can hang laundry or throw something on, uh, and, and that's about all that they ever come to be. It's interesting, Time Magazine in 2012, note the date, 2012, list of the top 10 commonly broken New Year's resolutions. I'm not going to go through all of them. It was written five years ago, but the list is still remarkable, remarkably similar to what I would say would probably take place today. And just some of them are this, uh, lose weight and get fit, uh, learn something new, eat healthier and diet, get out of debt and to save money, Spend more time with family. Travel to new places. Be less stressed. Now, I'll almost guarantee you could go back to 1970 and probably find about the exact same list. It's the type of thing that we go through year after year after year after year and say, all right, well, this year, you know, I gotta, I've got to exercise more. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to exercise in six weeks and... Oh, that was fun. Okay. Uh, now I just need to eat more. I lost way too much weight uh, in that process. But we, we have very common New Year's resolutions. And all of them can have value if implemented. I think they can make some necessary changes to our lives, but that's not going to be our focus today. I want our focus today to be on what's our walk with the Lord like? At a time when many are naturally pondering various aspects of their ministry, we need to put a focus on our spiritual life, our relationship with God is the most critical and most important relationship in our entire lives. To begin, it's important that we lay a right foundation. This relationship with God functions as the basis of every other relationship. In counseling sessions, we can go back and and I can pretty well examine, okay, if an individual is struggling with this relationship, I can go back and pretty well say, what's your relationship like with the Lord? How much time have you spent with Him? And 99.99999% of the time, The relationship with the Lord failed first, and then other relationships began to fail. So we say then that our relationship to God forms the basis of all other relationships. There are two conclusions then that we draw from that. Number one, a right relationship with God will result in a right relationship with others. It's a natural byproduct. When my relationship with God is what it needs to be, I will naturally have a right relationship with others. But the second is likewise true. A wrong relationship with God is inevitably going to result in a wrong relationship with others. I can pretty well guarantee that when your relationship with God is not what it ought to be, your relationship with other people is likewise not what it ought to be. Your relationship to God forms the basis of all of your other relationships. And so 
when we ponder all of these things, it is so important that we examine our relationship with God. And as we do so, I want to ponder this question, what is it that defines you? Recently, while reading a book, the author used an illustration that has prompted a tremendous amount of thought in my life, and the illustration was that of an iceberg, and it's led me to ponder what I've called iceberg Christianity. One of these days, I'm going to make it to Alaska, and when I make it, I'm going to be standing on that boat, and I'm going to take that very same picture. What does Glacier Bay really look like? I don't know, but I'm going to get there one day. I don't necessarily, I do want to see it from a boat, but I also want to see it from inside. And you know, I want to fish in Alaska. That's just what I, I want to fish. Uh, would I enjoy going hunting in Alaska? Yeah, I would enjoy that too. Uh, I, I think Alaska is one of the very few states that I've actually not been able uh, to be in. Alaskan cruise ships take thousands of individuals every single year to see Glaciers. Glacier is nothing more than a continuous deposit of snow and ice that never melts. On occasion, one breaks off and you get an iceberg. Well, an iceberg's pretty beautiful as well. In fact, if you look on icebergs on, and look at images, you'll see absolutely huge. The, the size of them in comparison to some of the boats is absolutely amazing. It's nothing more than a chunk off the old block. Told you it'd come around, okay? There's the chunk off the old block. The iceberg falls, and there it is. It's a sight to behold. Let me tell you, it is likewise a danger to avoid. And this is what forms the basis of a concept that I've somewhat developed with this idea of iceberg, Christ, of iceberg Christianity. Do you know that only 10% of an iceberg is above the surface? 90% of an iceberg is below the surface. The reality is that an iceberg, though the previous shot we just showed was one that was very beautiful. There's another side to it. And it's one that is very dangerous and destructive. Do you remember the large ship that was built that God couldn't even sink, known as the Titanic? An iceberg sunk that ship that God couldn't sink in a very short time. What makes them beautiful is what we see above the water. What makes them dangerous and destructive is the massive amount of ice that is below the surface. 90% of it is underwater and is invisible. What do I mean when I use the term iceberg Christianity? Several things come to mind. Number one, we are often content to only allow people to see a small portion of our lives. Very content. It has, just as, as that percentage of the iceberg, very small percentage is visible of, above the water, we are often quick to only let the small percentage be seen. Number two, what comes to mind, we want to be sure that what they see is very favorable. We, by doing so, embrace hypocrisy. Looks great. Glacier Bay, beautiful. The iceberg that broke off Absolutely beautiful. But below the surface lies a tremendous amount that is hidden from individuals. And in doing so, we have embraced 
hypocrisy. That leads us then to the danger of hypocrisy. We say all the time, hypocrisy has filled our churches today. And it has. That's a fair thing. Why has hypocrisy filled our churches, however? Is it not because individuals who fill our churches are content to let hypocrisy be the normal standard of their life? If the people that comprise the church weren't hypocritical, hypocrisy wouldn't be rampant in a church. It's there because we are content to let it be here in our own lives. When individuals cease to be hypocritical, do you realize that churches will no longer be filled with hypocrisy? Where's the problem? Problems with people, with the individual. Jesus stated in Matthew, I'm sorry, in Luke chapter 12 and verse number one, "Beware ye of the leaven of the Pharisees, which is hypocrisy." The word beware suggests you should be in a, a state of alert about this. You should be on guard regarding something. You know, hypocrisy is something that is quite subtle. It's something that we ought to always be on the guard against. If you read throughout all of Matthew 23, you'll find that Jesus denounces the Pharisees for their hypocrisy, but he described all of their works, really in one verse, in verse number five, he said, but all their works they do for to be seen of men. This is what governs them. What governs them is all of their works to be able to be seen of men. And he goes on throughout Matthew 23 and he illustrates specific ways in which they demonstrate their hypocrisy. Their entire religion emphasized more how they appeared before man than how they appeared before God. The result of it was a religion that was full of ourselves. The natural tendency in a message like this is to look at everybody else and say, well, I sure hope so-and-so is listening to this. But let me point out to you that I believe most Christians, if not all, are guilty of hypocrisy to some degree. So I'm not, I'm not guilty of hypocrisy. How many of you have caller ID on your phones? Simple illustration. You see a name come up. Oh. Hello? Did you want to talk to that person when you saw the name and the number show up? No. But when you answered it, you sounded as though you wanted to talk. Maybe you've had someone actually wake you up for, with a phone call. Did I wake you? I've said many times, no, no, no. <laughs> okay, I'm trying to figure out where I am, what time it is, uh, what I've missed, what I slept by. <laughs> I have no idea. Did I wake you? No, no, you're fine. Oh, who are you? What? <laughs> okay, what has just happened to me? We're guilty of hypocrisy to at least some degree. We come into churches at times and we... Put a smile on our face when there's anything but a smile in our heart. Why? Because we want to give the impression that everything's fine. We stand in long lines at stores, frustrated as all get out, oftentimes inside, sometimes seething inside. Hopefully we don't take it out on the clerk. Oh, no, it's fine, it's fine. I understand that every aisle I pick, somebody's not going to have the little sticker that scans. It was the short aisle, the long, the, the short line that I just saw. I'm going to be able to get out of the store here. And the last item of clothing did not have the sticker thing. So now we have to call someone in clothing. Oh, they took their lunch break. Nobody's in clothing. 
They're not there. Why? Because you need them. Okay? They're never in the departments you need that they're always in the departments you don't want them to be in. Right? Okay? And finally, you get to get up there, oh, I'm sorry for the wait. Oh, it's fine. No, it's not. You should be sorry. No, we don't go that route either. But my point is that we are guilty of doing this very same thing that we are so quick to condemn in the lives of other people. I am not advocating, by the way, that we come along and begin telling everybody everything that we've ever thought or ever done. Okay? I just want you to know I had this really bad thought about you this week. Mike, it's great to see you, but I just want you to know on Tuesday, I thought about you and I just hated you that day. Okay. That, he gets said a lot. <laughs> that doesn't need to happen, right? Okay. So we're not saying, you know, I, Mike, I, I really just can't stand you, but I prayed with you on Wednesday. Okay. That doesn't accomplish anything. So I'm not advocating that. But what I'm urging is that you and I determine that we are going to live a life that is free from hypocrisy. There's another aspect to this iceberg Christianity that concerns me. We attempt to hide 90% from God. This is the one that has my focus. These would be areas that we know we are wrong in, yet for whatever reason we're willing to hang on to them. We know that God sees and knows everything. Somehow we deceive ourselves into thinking that maybe God's going to overlook it. It's why Paul wrote in Galatians chapter 6 and verse 7, Be not deceived. God is not mocked, for whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. It is absolutely ridiculous to think that you are going to be able to hide something from God. We know that theologically, we know that factually in our own minds, yet somehow we think we are able to get away from this. We're able to somehow kind of fly under God's radar. He's got enough going on. Maybe he'll just kind of pass this on and this will end up being okay. Part of that iceberg that lies below the surface is the part that is destructive and the part that is very dangerous. And the reality is when we attempt in our own foolish minds to think that we are hiding things from God, we will find we are deceiving ourselves. Instead, we must strive to be completely open before God. Amen. All of that as the background leads me into this again. What defines you? To illustrate it, we'll look at the temptation of Jesus Christ. We're not going to see it in Matthew's account. We're going to see it in Luke's account. But before I look specifically at this temptation, I want us to go through a couple of things that are, we might say, preliminary, some foundational truths. Number one, Jesus was incapable of sinning. We have to establish that. This is not a test in Luke 4 or in Matthew 4 that Jesus is possible for him to be able to sin. He was faced with all of the temptation from the outside, but Jesus did not have the urge inside to succumb to it. It was impossible for him to sin. We have to say that because he is God. And in order for him to be God, he can't sin. Amen. So this isn't an issue as to whether or not Jesus Christ would sin. He was absolutely incapable of sin. It is certain that he was going to be victorious. And his temptation demonstrated to us that Jesus Christ is in fact whom he has claimed to be. He is God and his victory over Satan's temptation is one of many ways in which this fact is proven. We can explore this temptation from a variety of angles. 
Many have referenced it to 1 John chapter 2. Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. And look and say, well, here's the lust of the flesh and lust of the eyes and the pride of life. We're not going to do that. But I also want us to note that Satan did not doubt Jesus was the Son of God. I know our translation says, if thou be the Son of God. The word if can also be understood by the word since. James chapter 2 and verse 19, Thou believest there is one God, thou doest well. Notice the devils also believe and tremble. Did Satan know who Jesus Christ was? Absolutely he did. He knew he was the Son of God. He was created. He was in heaven. He knew exactly who it was, and let me point out to you, he still does today. He knows he has an end. He does not know when it's going to be, but he knows he has an end. To cause him then to be more recognizable and easily identified, the third preliminary consideration is this. Satan tempted him to do the miraculous. Do something special. Do something miraculous that is going to make your presence and your identity completely known. Jesus, if you would do these certain things, everybody is going to know who you claim to be. We could say in many ways that his temptation centered on his identity. To this point in the life of Jesus, his earthly ministry had just begun. He was, relatively speaking, unknown by nearly everybody. He certainly did not come from a prestigious background or from a prestigious city. We just celebrated his birth and we spent much time looking at that. He's in the town of Nazareth, born to a very poor couple. There's nothing about his background that would suggest that he was the long-awaited Messiah, but he was the very Son of God. Satan's temptation is going to center on his identity, and the first one is this, an identity based on activity. Let's say it this way, I am what I do. Luke chapter number 4, if you'll notice verse number 1, the Bible says, Jesus being full of the Holy Ghost returned from Jordan and was led by the Spirit into the wilderness, being forty days tempted of the devil. And in those days he did eat nothing. And when they were ended, he afterward hungered. And the devil said unto him, verse number 3, If thou be the Son of God, command this stone that it be made bread. Satan's reasoning, in essence, was this. Since you are God, do something that will satisfy you. His identity would be based on his activity. Was Jesus capable of commanding a stone to be made bread? Absolutely. He possessed the power to do so. But the essence of this temptation, do something that's going to satisfy you. Engage in this activity. You deserve it. God doesn't expect you to die. So Jesus, do something. Command of this stone that it be made bread. Do you know many people are identified by the activity in which they engage themselves? That to them is in essence their life. You want to do a quick test to see where your identity is? Let it be removed from you. And you'll find out all of a sudden where your identity is. 
when what has defined you is removed, what do you have left? Hopefully, a solid faith. But if your identity is wrapped up in some sort of activity, when it is removed from you, you will find that you virtually have absolutely nothing left. This is a type of individual who engages in all this activity to satisfy their demands. When we describe them from a purely secular realm, we would describe these individuals as being workaholics. Take them away from work and they virtually have no existence and no identity. There are some who struggle with the idea of retirement because their identity for years has been wrapped up in what they do. They have no existence apart from that. I believe the same thing happens to us spiritually. To illustrate this, I'd like us to turn to Luke chapter number 10, just a few chapters over. Luke chapter number 10, it's the story of Mary and Martha. Jesus has come over for dinner. You can imagine what that would be like. It's certainly fair to say that you would want everything to be absolutely perfect. You would want things to be well at hand. You would want things to be uh, done in such a manner that is going to bring, uh, that is going to be pleasing to him, and, and it would create a, a tremendous amount of stress. Matthew, or I'm sorry, Luke 10, verse number 38. It came to pass as they went that he entered into a certain village, and a certain woman named Martha received him into her house. And she had a sister called Mary, which also sat at Jesus' feet. And heard his word. But Martha was cumbered about much serving, and came to him and said, Lord, dost thou not care that my sister hath left me to serve alone? Bid her therefore that she help me. And Jesus answered and said unto her, Martha, Martha, thou art careful and troubled about many things. But one thing is needful. And Mary hath chosen that good part which shall not be taken away from her. Where did it all go wrong? I believe, number one, it began with improper priorities. The Bible describes the situation in verse number 40 with Martha as being cumbered about much serving. It's quite possible for activity to become our primary focus. Do you think that her motives were pure? I think they were. Do you think that her goal was proper? I think that it was as well. But yet she allowed her priorities to take the wrong focus. Do you know how quickly that happens? <laughs> it is... I. I wish I could say it's a daily struggle. Okay? If I could eliminate this to just every day I have to deal with it, that would be a minor victory for me. It seems like it's an hourly focus. Okay? All sorts of things try to pull us in this direction and in that direction and all of these things, and many of which I think are good. We're not talking about things that are contradicted in the Word of God. Obviously, that's activity we should not be engaged in. These are all good things. But the problem is that these good things took the place of what was most important. God has a unique way of getting our attention to get our focus back where it needs to be. Amen. It's a lot easier to do so of your own accord. <laughs> okay, He can win that battle if you really want to fight Him on it, but I don't think any one of us wants to fight Him on it. So let's be mindful of, of our priorities. When your priorities are wrong, it will lead to, number two, an improper perspective. She was cumbered about much serving. Serving can be work. It's labor. It's tiring. Okay? Um, I know they, 
They say, uh, I've heard this many times, and many people never work a day in your life. You should always enjoy it so much that it's never like work. I, maybe I just have way too much of a pessimistic mindset, and that's quite possible. Well, let me tell you, I've worked plenty of days, even as a pastor. I go, man, is it just always enjoyable? No, it's not. It's tiring. It can be a lot of work. It can be a lot of stress. It can be a lot of frustration. Okay? Is there the joy to it? Absolutely there is. But the flip side of it's true as well. You've had days at your job that, yeah, you worked. <laughs> Was it just that grand? One of customers cussing you up one side and down the other? Man, this is exactly how I pictured retirement to be. <laughs> Nobody thinks that. Okay? It's... I understand it sounds great, but to me, it's far from reality. Now, our mindset towards it needs to be proper. But when our priorities are wrong, it will lead to an improper perspective on things. She was cumbered about much serving. And she began getting pretty frustrated with Mary. This was not a four-bedroom ranch-style home where Jesus and Mary were sitting in a living room and she's in the kitchen and the dining room. She's seeing everything. And after a while, and I think it took a while, their sisterly relationship came out. Are you kidding me? I'm doing all this work and you're doing nothing? You want to get two sisters mad? I don't know whether two brothers get mad, but I can tell you, two sisters, yeah, based on my home, yeah, they get pretty ill. Okay? One's doing something, the other one's doing nothing. Uh, mm -mm. Not a good day. Not going to be good perspectives drawn from this. The frustration begins to mount. It takes some time, but after a while, poof, there goes the explosion. <laughs> there goes the cap. There it goes. And all, everything just breaks loose. And here we go. What began with an improper priority leads to an improper perspective, which leads thirdly to an improper conclusion. You know what she actually said? Verse 40, read it. Lord, dost thou not care? Think about those words. Lord, don't you care? Man, if we stopped right there, what a ridiculous question to ask. God, you don't care about me? He has proven himself faithful time after time after time. There's no doubt that God cares about me as a person. And I'm glad he loves the world. And I'm glad that he sent his son to die for the sins of the world. But it is a far more encouraging reality when I ponder this truth. God loves me. Amen. And He loves you. Amen. And it's amazing. It sure is undeserved. But here's the question. Lord, don't you care? Don't you care, let's say it this way, what I'm going through? How in the world can we even ask that question when we just ponder how God has every single day demonstrated how He cares for us? When your priorities are wrong and your perspective's wrong, I can assure you, you'll come to some faulty conclusions. Your reasoning will not be very sound. An improper... Priority will lead to an improper perspective, which will lead to an improper conclusion. And number four, it will lead to an improper solution. Again, verse number 40. Lord, don't you care that she's left me to serve alone? Here's the solution. <laughs> Bid her, therefore, that she help me. Tell her to come help me. Let's get her involved in this frenzied activity as well. 
Interesting. How many times is our solution do more? Do more. Well, I, I just can't find any happiness. So what do we tell people? Do more. Why well, I, I can't find my place in church. Well, well, do more. Maybe it is time that we stop doing more. And we start growing more. We start being more. I've spoken with many different individuals who've shared that they can't find their place in whatever it might be. Life, church, whatever. And their mindset is, I guess I just need to do something more. I need to go do this. I need to go, I need a change. What am I going to, well, uh, uh, I don't know. I need to, do, um, I need to, uh, let me go, uh, let me go move to California. What? Well, I, I'm just not happy. My dad always told me, and I've seen this, I, I couldn't stand it when he told me. But boy, I sure have seen it many times. Son, when you move or leave, you take your biggest problem with you. I said, yeah, you're right. My wife and kids will come. Uh, <laughs> not what he meant, okay? <laughs> I think he meant me, but I'm not sure. No. <laughs> There's the truth to that. Well, I, I can't find my niche in life, so just do something. No, be. Stop being so defined by activity that your existence is wrapped up in what you do. Jesus' response to this is quoted from Deuteronomy chapter 8 and verse number 3, where the Bible says that he humbled thee and suffered thee to hungry and fed thee with manna which thou knewest not, neither did thy fathers know that he might make thee know that man doth not live by bread only. But by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of the Lord doth man live. Amen. His response in Luke chapter 4 was just simply that man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word of God. That leads us to saying this. The essence of life is not contained in the temporary satisfaction that comes from doing things. But this is exactly what defines so many believers today. If you're still in Luke 10, notice in verse number 41 what Jesus said. He answered, said unto Martha, Martha, I don't know whether he was shaking his head no or not. I seem to think that he always, he is. Um, I can just see Jesus, Martha, Martha. <laughs> you just don't have this figured out yet. You are careful and troubled about many things. Does not mean that she's cautious about many things. Caution can be a good thing. You are full of care. You are troubled and anxious. You are torn apart. Look at you, you're a mess. Have you ever noticed that the people who are defined by activity are a mess? They're frenzied, they're panicked, they're worried, they've got all sorts of things going on physically. The list goes on and on and on and on. You're a mess. Same point in time, God can fix messes. <laughs> I'm living proof of that. You are too. Unless you laugh too hard. Okay. Jonah's another one. God can fix messes. God does an awfully good job. Martha, you're careful and troubled about many things. But this is the thing. As soon as I saw this passage, I read it somewhere. I don't even remember where I read it. It was in our devotional. Last, I think last week, Luke 10, 38 through 42 came up. 
As soon as I saw the reference, I was convicted. I was like, great. Okay, here we go. Because I find myself in this camp all the time. This whole thing has always puzzled me, verse 42. One thing is needful. Now, I would say one thing is important. One thing is needful, meaning it's essential. You can't live without it, needful. Well, I got a whole bunch of things that are like that. You see the problem? Your, your identity is based on your activity. And Jesus says, Martha, you're a mess. <laughs> And let me tell you, only one thing is absolutely necessary. One thing is essential. And Mary hath chosen that part, that good part, which shall not be taken away from her. Martha, you're careful and troubled about many things only one thing is needful, and it's Mary. Lord, you've got to be kidding me. She hasn't done anything. Look at everything that I have done. Do you know in Matthew chapter 7, when Jesus teaches that not everyone's going to enter into heaven? There will be many that day who say, Lord, Lord, have we not done? Look at all of the activity that I've engaged in. Surely it's going to count for something. I even did these things in your name. I did these things for you and to advance you. I did. The problem is I never knew you. There was never a relationship there. So many Christians today deal with this very issue of an identity that is based on activity. We say, I am what I do. That's not it, folks. That's not it. When you keep the iceberg image in your own mind, remember that 90% that's below the surface? Remember the 90% that we said, well, God, you know, I mean, I can hide this from God. How many times do we rationalize the 90% below the surface by trying to point to the good that we're doing, the good 10%? Well, I mean, Okay, I, I know that I have a problem with, with stealing. But I give 10% to the Lord's work that I steal. Now, by the way, <laughs> let me just tell you, if you're robbing a bank, please don't tithe on that, okay? <laughs> I don't want to be a part of that, okay? I'm good, all right? Well, if I do this good over here, then it's going to kind of Balance out. Is that how God works? Mm -mm. But yet, we fail to consider that God's going to be displeased with this area that I know is wrong in my own life. Man, my life appears beautiful on the surface. But when I let God go down below the surface. He's got a lot of work to do in me. Amen. I think he's probably got a lot of work to do in you. And you know, it's kind of painful when God starts chiseling away those parts underneath the water, isn't it? But it's always best. It's always best. Well, I'd rather keep the 10% and let's just kind of agree it doesn't work that way. 
What defines you? What defines who you are? Is your identity wrapped up in activity? Tonight I'll continue this on and we'll not deal with it today, but let me just tell you where it's going. There's an identity that's based on prestige. This person says, I am what I have. Then there's an identity based on popularity. I am what others think. And then there's an identity based on reality. I am what God knows. It gets quite convicting and challenging. How has the Lord spoken to your heart this morning? As the musicians come...